Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera and my second video for today which is uh, Saturday, December 19th. I'm still here at Hinokicho Park. Uh, the sun has come up a little bit more and is warming things up a little bit uh, more than earlier so getting a little bit nicer to be here. Uh, the subject of my second video today is a really interesting and really unusual camera and one which I don't often find in good condition even here in Japan and this is the Minolta V3 rangefinder camera. For those of you who are new to my channel, I sell vintage Japanese cameras. Uh, you can find them at my online store, japanvintagecamera.com. You can also find them at my Etsy store, which is also called Japan Vintage Camera. And I also have an eBay store. So uh, if you'd like to purchase this camera or another vintage Japanese camera, please visit one of my stores or all of them. I'll post links to my stores in the description below the video. So the Minolta V3 was a, re a replacement for the Minolta V2, which was introduced in 1958. Uh, the V3 came out in 1960. Uh, these cameras were quite famous for their really high shutter speeds. Uh, they, they offered the fastest shutter speeds you could get in a rangefinder camera at the time. Uh, the Minolta V2 featured a maximum shutter speed of 1 2,000th of a second, and in order to improve upon that, uh, Minolta invented the V3, which had a 1 3,000th of a second shutter speed. So uh, the idea behind these cameras was to try to have a, or make a camera which could, I guess, stop action. So if you had kids or pets or something like that, and you wanted to be able to get a picture of them running around without any blur or stuff like that, a really fast shutter speed was quite a, a, an interesting feature to have. Uh, these are really cool cameras. They, they have a really good solid feel in the hand, very much like a Leica camera. And the weight is very similar to a Leica. And I, uh, I guess perhaps that's one of the, the reasons later on that Minolta produced, I guess, Leica M mount bodies and things like that. Uh, the style of the lens reminds me a little bit of the Minolta 2B camera, which was uh, quite an interesting camera, which has almost the same lens as this one. And uh, yeah, just an overall really solid and hefty feel. Uh, the one thing which kind of differentiates this from uh, Minolta's other rangefinder cameras, such as the 2 and 2B B series or the V2, is this camera has a built-in light meter. So uh, uh, quite an improvement over the earlier cameras, or at least it was uh, back in the day. Uh, the light meter in this particular camera still seems to work quite well. Uh, and that's one thing to kind of watch for if you're uh, trying to buy one of these. Another thing to look for in these cameras is, though they are well-made cameras, um, for some reason they are a little bit prone to corrosion. So if they're not properly stored, uh, the chrome plating on these can get quite deteriorated, as well as the chrome plating uh, around the shutter and aperture rings. So uh, yeah, keep that in mind if you're looking for one of these cameras. Uh, if the, the finish is deteriorated or has problems, it doesn't really make much of any difference in the performance of the camera. The really important features of these cameras are the lens, the shutter, and the viewfinder. And so long as these three, three things are in good working order, the camera should take good photographs. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the features and functions and such of the Minolta V3, starting from the top. Uh, here we have the film rewind lever, and it has an arm which pops out, and a roller handle on the end, which makes it quite easy to rewind the film. Unlike other rangefinder cameras, Minolta puts the frame counter kind of on the opposite side, so it's located here on the left side instead of the right side, which is where you would usually find it on uh, rangefinder cameras of other makes. By the top here is quite flat. Uh, no no access screws or anything on the top other than the one right here for the uh, light meter. Here you have a shoe for mounting a flash gun and of course this one is a cold shoe and if you're going to operate a flash you'll have to plug it into the flash sink socket on the bottom here. Here we have the shutter release button and it accepts a standard cable release. And on the right side here is the light meter readout and when you are adjusting the film speed you have to do that by turning this uh, knob here and it doesn't give you a, a huge variety in uh, film speeds but it just does give you the ones which are most popular today so if you want to shoot say uh, 400 800 or 200 speed film uh, you can do that with the Minolta V2 it has kind of a what is a um, I guess uh, EV system for the light meter and as you turn it you'll see a different EV values shown here and what you do when you are programming the EV value in the lens is just use a combination of uh, shutter and aperture speeds to show the correct EV number located in this window. Uh, the back of the camera here, we have a uh, 
course the viewfinder window and we have the shutter cocking lever on the back uh, keep in mind that this is a double stroke camera kind of like an early uh, Leica M3 or Konica 2A uh, the extra uh, spring tension required for the higher shutter speeds requires, I guess, more leverage to wind the shutter. So, uh, yeah, it's a double stroke shutter. On the back here, you have a reminder dial to remind you what kind of film you have loaded in the camera. Uh, once again, uh, as I've said in previous videos, this is merely a reminder and uh, the camera will operate the same regardless of where you have this set. So if you forget to change this or set it to the wrong setting, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, when you are loading the film, you do have to make sure that you set the proper film speed using this dial here. On the front here, we have the viewfinder assembly. On this front side here, we have the glass which covers the light meter cell. Uh, this is the window for the, the rangefinder. Here we have the matte glass for the projected frame lines and of course the viewfinder window itself. In front of that we have the focusing ring, uh, which turns quite smoothly on these cameras. And we have a nice focusing uh, tab here, which makes it a little bit easier to turn. Uh, we have a focusing scale set in meters here, and behind that, uh, between the focusing ring and the camera body, we have a depth of field scale, which is a little bit hard to see. It's kind of small, but uh, it allows you to see how much depth of field you have at any given aperture. In front of that you have a couple of switches. First you have the X and M switch, which you say switch into the X mode when you're shooting a flash. And here this green lever is the self-timer lever. Uh, once again, I recommend do not use the self-timers on these old cameras because uh, they are not as well made as the shutters and other mechanisms and they are always the weak link. So try to avoid using these whenever possible. Uh, in front of these two levers we have the aperture control ring. And in front of the aperture control ring, of course, we have the shutter speed ring. And so, uh, once again, as I said previously, when you are taking a light reader meeting with, the, uh, with this light meter, uh, once again, uh, take a look and see what number is shown here. For example, if I'm using, say, 400 speed film, and I'm going to take a picture of the pond, which is located behind uh, my camera right here, uh, it's recommending or showing an EV of 12. So what I would do is I would kind of adjust these rings until I get down to an EV12. And here I say uh, in the day in the light I have, I want to shoot, uh, say something with a fast shutter speed. I can shoot at f1.8 at one thousandth of a second. But uh, if I don't want to shoot, you know, something like that, say I want something with more depth of field, I can simply uh, turn the ring over here. And if if I turn the rings together and keep the knob on 12, then it gives me a combination of different apertures and shutter speed uh, ranges. So for example, uh, EV12 would also be 1 8th of a second at f22. Normally I like to shoot around f8 or so, so that would give me around, say, a 60th of a second uh, at f8. So quite a simple system to use, and yeah, uh, it, I won't say it's foolproof, but uh, once you get used to it, uh, it it's quite easy. On the front here we have kind of the magic part of the camera which is the 45mm f1.8 lens which is actually an excellent performer. Uh, these are really well made lenses, they are not prone to uh, fungus haze or other problems and when they do have any kind of fungus or haze in most cases it can be cleaned out quite easily. Uh, cleaning out the lens on these is not so difficult. Uh, you do have to take a little bit of care. Uh, what I do to clean them, or if the shutter is a little sticky or something, I'll apply a little uh, lighter fluid around the filter uh, ring threads, and using a rubber stopper, I will turn out the plastic ring. And underneath, you can kind of see the aluminum block which holds the lens assembly, and it has notches on either side. And with a tool, I just unscrew the front lens element, and that gives me access to the insides of the lens elements and to the shutter. So I can clean it up a little bit, I can clean up the glass, and that makes a big difference in the performance of the camera. Uh, when you do take out the front lens elements, you have to be careful of the rings for these levers, because they kind of sit around uh, the block which holds in the front uh, lens assembly, so you, you have to kind of make sure that those are centered, and you kind of wiggle them around a little bit as you thread the lens back in uh, to make sure it seats properly. Uh, loading the film in the camera is quite easy. Uh, this one has a lever on the top, just like the Olympus uh, camera I did a review about earlier. Pop it open like so. Uh, like uh, more modern cameras, you push up on the fork here to allow access for the film cartridge. Once the cartridge is set inside, push it back down to lock the cartridge in place. Pull the film meter across the back of the lens here, this chamber, and feed it into the take-up spool. And simply wind it 
with the thumb wheel here until the film is pulled all the way across and the holes on both sides of the film are uh, fitting or I guess uh, covering the uh, teeth on the take up wheel here. Uh, once that's done, close the film door and simply wind the shutter until the number one shows up in the film counter window here and the camera is ready to shoot. So anyway, uh, that's it for my video about the Minolta V3. I'll be listing this camera for sale hopefully later today in my online stores. Uh, if you're interested in purchasing it, uh, please check out my stores. I have a lot more cameras which are waiting to have videos made about them. I'll get those uh, up and uh, posted as soon as I have time to do so. Uh, if you like the video, uh, please like it. If you want to subscribe, uh, please subscribe. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you tune in again soon.